Hello, my name is Dave Coker. Welcome to the learning chunk that accompanies the case study. Today we're going to talk about capital structure. And like most of these learning chunks, we're going to ask a rhetorical question to help you understand exactly what goes on and why, case, why capital structure actually uh, matters. And the question we're going to ask today is, are you building a house of cards? In other words, when you actually set up your firm's capital structure, are you building something that's there and it's going to last? Or are you building a house of cards? And in the slightest economic downturn, when the macro environment turns against you, is your whole business going to collapse totally? It's a very, very important question. The outcomes that we're going to do today is we're going to help you understand the importance of capital structure. As managers, you'll be building companies. It's very important you get the framework in place and get it set up right, much like when you build a house. If you build a house with a very, very weak framework, it doesn't matter how pretty it looks. If the slightest gust of wind comes, it might collapse. It doesn't matter. You have to build it properly. You have to put a good framework in place. So we're going to understand the importance of capital structures. And when we do this, hopefully you're going to walk away, and I'm sure you will with the idea, with the concept, with the understanding that simple formulaic approaches do not work. In other words, there's a sort of an art to this whole process. We can put a good chunk of science behind it, but at the end of the day, the manager has to look beyond the enterprise. The manager cannot depend upon a simple formula that says, yes, your capital structure is adequate, or no, it's inadequate. So when we start to look at this, you know, an, an interesting thing, an interesting question to ask is, why do I care about capital structures? What is it about capital structures that matter? Well, Michael Milliken, famous for starting the whole high-yield market, the, what we call junk bonds uh, in the States, had a very interesting quote that has stuck with me for a number of years. He said, it doesn't matter whether a company is big or small, capital structure matters. It always has and it always will. Michael Milliken said that about 20 years ago. Why did Michael Milliken say that? Why do you think it's so important that the junk bond king, the gentleman that when he was fined a billion dollars by a U.S. court, he whipped out his checkbook and wrote a check on the spot? I can't do that. He thinks it's important. Let's see if we can go a little bit deeper and understand why Michael Milliken thinks capital structure is so important. Well, when we start to look at capital structures, we know there's something very fascinating going on because when firms raise money, there's lots of different ways they can raise money to capitalize their enterprise. Uh, traditionally, before the emergence of the capital markets, you folks know that, that the only way firms could raise money was by approaching banks for a loan. It's still that way in lots of parts of the world. Uh, different countries have migrated away from, from the bank-dependent capital uh, raise type of method to more, a more Anglo-American capital market structure. But still, in lots of parts of the world, the way companies raise money is via bank loans. But in Anglo-American capitalism, it's a little bit different. We raise money via the markets, via the capital markets, via those wondrous mechanisms that have emerged to bring borrowers and savers together to allow for a free flow of surplus of liquidity to a deficit from money where it is to money where it needs to be. That's the role of the capital market. And when companies raise money, when they start to build this framework, their capital structure, certain things happen. They can raise money via equity. And that's the classic way, right? They sell shares. They sell ownership of the company, fractional ownership, to outside investors. It's a very classic way to raise money. And it's interesting because when we look at this, we know it's got the highest possible return because it's got the highest possible risk. And if firms only raised money via equity, guess what? They wouldn't be able to raise so much money because many entities, individuals included, simply will not take on the amount of risk associated with shares. It's, uh, it's either beyond their charter, it's not within their, their utility function, their risk reward, uh, the amount of risk and reward that they can bear. They may not go for that, right? So that's how come there's debt. And debt is a four-letter word. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But debt is borrowing. So what the enterprise does then, instead of selling off fractional ownership of the company, they sell off uh, debt. They incur debt. They raise money by borrowing it from entities. Those entities may include organizations, public or private, or people. And they actually borrow money. And, of course, this is lower risk. It's the lowest risk in the capital structure. It still may be high risk overall, but it's relatively low risk. And since we've introduced this concept of, of raising money via equity, raising money via debt, 
a reasonable question would be, well, you know, how could we actually mix it up? You know, what type of ratio would be appropriate? Well, we know that if we start to look at things, if we, if we take the value of equity and the value of the firm, when we put it together, when we bring it together, if we try to raise money by equity only, sure, we can do it. We can definitely float shares and raise the firm's money only by equity. Startup companies do this almost all, of, all the time. You read about these companies that have almost no debt because they raised all their money via equity. And, of course, the classic way out for the initial round investors is the IPO, right? So the company raises money, the hot technology company, that's a stereotype, raises its money purely by issuing equity. And then later on, the founders, they want to get their capital out. So what they do is they IPO, and then everybody walks away happy and rich, and, and everybody's multimillionaires from, from that point on. Maybe not, though, right? Because it isn't really optimal. We know firms can't raise money for the long term solely by means of equity. So in reality, what happens is they have a mix. They actually put the two together. And an interesting question would be, and you can see what, uh, according to the PowerPoint that we've got, when we start to mix debt and equity, we don't have this straight line up any longer. We've got a curvilinear relationship between the value of the firm and the amount of debt and equity, the ratio. In other words, how much debt do they raise for every, every dollar of equity or vice versa? You can look at it both ways. So we can add some debt to the mixture. And when we add debt to the mixture, it turns out we can reach an optimal point for that ratio where firm value is maximized for a specific ratio. You know, but an interesting question would be, how do we actually identify that point? And yes, there are formulaic solutions that would say, here's that point in the, in the debt to equity ratio where firm value is maximized. But you know something? It doesn't really work that way always. As you saw with the case study that we went through, the panel discussion that followed, sometimes there's exogenous factors that intrude upon the firm. The firm has to be aware of these external factors. So you can't apply a simple formula, guys, and expect that formula to tell you what the optimal debt-to-equity ratio is. You plug it in, then you collect a big, fat paycheck as a manager of the firm. It's not that easy. It's, there's no secret here. Otherwise, why would the firm need you? They got the formula. Just plug the numbers in and we're done. It doesn't work that way. Because it turns out that there are subjective elements to it. Managers have to be aware of the macro environment. They have to be aware of things external to the enterprise. And when they structure the debt-to-equity ratio, when they build the capital structure for the enterprise, we are trying to build something that will stand the test of time. No matter how the macroeconomic factors change, we go from recession, pardon me, we go from boom time to recession to boom time to depression. Firms that are set up properly, remember what Michael Milliken said, capital structure matters. And firms that are set up properly will be able to stand the test of time. So we tend to say that the pornography test applies. And let me, let me explain what this means. There was a Supreme Court justice, Justice Stewart, who said in 1984, uh, America is sort of repressive in the terms of the, the literature that can be published. And it's, it's good, don't get me wrong. But what they do is they don't allow certain, what they consider pornography to be published. And when the publisher went to court, he went to the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court, and he kept getting smacked down, smacked down, losing court case. And Judge Stewart there sat there on the, the, on the bench, and when he was asked to define pornography, he said, I don't have to define pornography because I know what it is when I see it. It's very simple wisdom. And it turns out that the optimal ratio for debt structure, for debt to equity structure, for capital structures is the same way. You can't just plug numbers in a formula, guys, and use a calculator and come up with a number. There's definitely the numbers, and those are inputs, but then there's a little bit of knowing it when you see it. And that the only way you develop that is by being an experienced manager. And one good rule of thumb is when debt service becomes burdensome, when the enterprise is struggling to make debt payments, then yeah, it may not be optimal, the amount of debt they've taken on. And at that point, we say it's safe to say we've gone too far. And you know, we know there's different types of enterprises. We know that there's some companies, you could have two companies in two different in in industries, capitalize the same, absolutely identical, except one sells a, 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 a smartphone, the other one sells books. One company's cash rich, lots of money coming in, the other one isn't so cash rich. They're both asset rich, though. One company would have a problem with a certain capital structure because it couldn't make the payments. The bookseller might be struggling to make the payments on debt, where at the same time, the, the, the wireless telecom company, the manufacturer of smartphones, is doing really, really well. He or she 
owns the company that owns the technology that makes the hot phones, and there's no problem anymore. So it really is subjective, and as managers, you've got to think about these factors because it's very important. What happens if you go too far? And as we say in the slides, it gets nasty. It gets very, very nasty very, very quick. Here's what happens. If you don't service debt, if the owners of the company, I mean, the managers of the company don't service debt, the creditors, the people that have lent the company money that help build up the debt side of the debt-to-equity ratio in the capital structure, the debt holders will actually push the firm into bankruptcy. Debtors seize control. What happens to the owners? Equity is wiped out. Owners get nothing. Debtors seize control of the company. And the house of cards, as we called it, collapses. So clearly, too much debt is bad. Now, if you're looking for thought leaders when we talk about this, it turns out that Medigliani and Miller, going back to 58, the seminal paper, please read it. It'll be in the My MBA resource. It's very, very good to get that. Stieglitz did a very, very good paper, 74, talking about the optimal uh, debt, debt to equity ratio, the optimal capital structure. And finally, Merton did a very, very good paper in 1990, once again, struggling with this problem. So clearly, given all the research that's been done by academics, all the spectacular failures that have under, under, we've seen in the market, that have been observed in the market, capital structure matters, and it's very, very important that you get it right first time. My name is Dave Coker. Thank you very much.